What is up? What is up? Welcome back to, to another episode of Talkative. We're back. I'm your host, Jason Martinez, and this is episode 11 of the show. Thank you guys for whoever's listening to, for joining me on this week's episode. A few topics that we're talking about this week, um, one of them being COD Warzone anti-cheat mitigations for the anti-cheat known as Ricochet. And we're also going to be going over the specs and the big... Um, portion of this topic as a whole and the charging speed of honors magic 4 pro which is honors latest flagship now actually you know let, let's just carry on from that point honor what is honor and what are they known for well honor is actually a subgroup and they were owned previously by huawei which if you guys don't know who huawei are they're a chinese smartphone manufacturing company and honor was a little subgroup under that particular company and a few years later after they've been on Huawei for so long they decided to disband and just be their own independent company they manufacture things like smartphone handsets targeting younger consumers the, the more younger audience and make things like computers wearable technology and all of that sorts so their, their latest flagship, which is their, their main smartphone device, which goes by the name Magic. Pretty catchy. Uh, I like that naming or branding route. Um, it's slated to be released pretty soon, but the main eye catcher with this phone, besides all the specs, is the charging speed. Now, this, this phone charges at 100 watts. 100 watts of power going through this phone to maintain it charged and well that is now to me that is insane to me because for a couple of reasons i personally have never owned a android device so to be real with you i just started to really get a feel for quick charging speeds because i'm using the iphone 13 pro which charges at 20 watts with uh, with the MagSafe, MagSafe charger plug. And to me, 20 watts is a lot. I mean, coming from somebody that, that would use the five watt adapter for three years prior to getting this phone, five watts, it got to the point where that's, that wattage was super slow that I felt that I was charging my phone for eternity, for forever. Now mind you, 20 watts is not fast, especially for how crazy these companies are going out with charging speeds 20 watts compared to other phones is not fast at all but for me on, on a personal level it, it's definitely a game changer so i can imagine how quick and it says it right here 0 to 50 in 15 minutes and 0 to 130 minutes obviously anything on paper anything with a marketing term behind it could seem over exaggerated but no if you watch videos and see the charging test and the battery test of this phone it's legit it actually charges within that time frame now a lot of people say a lot of people have speculations and they're a little skeptical about this right isn't this harmful to the phone's battery on a long-term level and yes in a way it could be because I, I really, you know, me and a lot of other people online agree that 100 watts is unnecessary for a charging speed of a flash smartphone of today. That these charging speeds are more accustomed to like bigger form factors of computers, not much smartphones, but more like laptops, computer, like actual rigs and consoles, you know. But I feel like for a smartphone, 100 watts is a little pushy it's kind of pushing it over it and yeah i mean if you charge your, your phone irresponsibly and when i what i mean by irresponsibly i mean like always keeping it at a high level of above 90 or 100 and charging it overnight without finding the right time to unplug it yes this could be harmful for your phone because at the same time you're allowing that much power going going through I mean, the for one, okay, for one, the battery is pretty big, um, 4,600 uh, milliamp hours on this battery, pretty big battery, 4,600 milliamp hours, 
but at the same time i feel like that doesn't balance out the amount of power it's going through this phone when, when, whenever you're charging it 100 watts is a lot of like that that's literally close to how much a tesla is required to fully charge that that's how much power this is and yeah i mean in a way it could be unnecessary it could be harmful to your device's battery or your device as a whole but you know like i said these are all major marketing terms yes they they want the consumer they want the audience to be um jaw dropped to, to to see this and be like oh wow this is like the one phone that i've heard of that can charge this speed that's pretty impressive but it will have big big effects on, on your phone um overall and to be honest i don't think 100 watts is necessary is it impressive yes um is is it nice to have that quick of a charging speed yes but for for this type of charging speed to in the future have long-term effects on my overall smartphone's health i'd rather take a lower charging speed than sacrifice any any bit of health on my smartphone whether it's in a battery or any bit of hardware components overall so i mean like i said on paper when you're reading something like this it's impressive but i don't really think it's necessary but i mean it, it exists we we have these flagship smartphones nowadays that charge from 45 50 60 plus and now 100 watts of charge but you know our arguments can vary opinions can vary depending on what people think and how much they know in terms of these batteries so and overall battery technology um but yeah overall 100 watts impressive on paper I don't really think it's necessary for a smartphone. On to the specs. Now, this phone, pretty familiar with specs. If you were to keep up with modern day smartphone flagships, you have a pretty equipped camera here with a 50 megapixel main camera, a 50 megapixel ultra wide, 122 degree field of view, which is pretty interesting, and a 64 megapixel telescope that offers a 3.5 times optical zoom now 122 degrees i wonder how that would look when filming like 360 or you know a bigger field of view type of video because i don't know to me it's like a i don't know it's an odd number i feel like you know if you're not gonna go 180 or 360 then why go in between you get what i mean but still pretty impressive cameras 50 megapixels um I mean, there's some cameras out there that go above 100 megapixels, but 50 for a flagship, it's pretty good. You know, you're, you're getting a bigger picture, better quality in terms of photos, and just a wide area when it comes to taking photos and finding the right shot. So 50, megap 50 megapixel all around on every camera lens. Pretty impressive. Impressive indeed. And the 3.5 optical zoom, a lot lower than what a lot of um, other flagship Android devices have. I feel like 3.5 optical zooms with a telescope, you can get really close in a lot of images and objects um, with that optical zoom. So I'm impressive with the cameras. If you're into photography, video making, or if cameras like the one section for you that you look in when you buy a smartphone, I think you'll be pretty impressive with these specs. So. Good stuff for the camera. Now, the display. The Magic 4 Pro is equipped with a 6.81 inch, pretty impressive size, LTPO OLED display with a very broad refresh rate of 120 hertz. Now, this is this is what I was referring to to like common specs. A lot of phones have these type of specs, whether it's LTPO technology or AMOLED or OLED. So, which means you'll have your variable refresh rates your beautiful colors with the oled display panels they're always on display functionality with the ltpo and just all the good stuff with this um display specs overall so like i said if you're into tech if you're really much of a tech geek you know that these specs are pretty much common to watch smartphones nowadays 
I mean, the one company that just started to catch up was Apple, releasing 120 hertz um, variable refresh rates last year, 2021, for the 13 Pro and the 13 lineup. So the display is actually curved all around four edges of the display, so kind of like the old Galaxy S5 around around the the curved edges. A lot of people actually let me touch base on that. A lot of people don't really like the curved edges when it comes to smartphone displays. I think it's cool. You know, I think it really gives off that um, futuristic um, dystopian type of look to it. But I do get why people find curved displays annoying because you can accidentally tap something on the side that you don't really want to touch. And because the, dis the, the display is so curved on the, on the edges, your, your thumb or any, any finger of your hand can either slip and touch any area of that side of the display and it could just mess up with over your overall experience. And I get it. And I see why people would prefer flat edges over the curved edges. But personally, I think curved curve edges really adds in that futuristic touch a lot of smartphones, and I, I find it good to be honest. But I do understand that argument of, you know, have it being very in, um, intrusive and annoying when you're trying to use your phone. So, yeah. But yeah, all four edges of this Magic 4 Pro have curved edges, or are, are curved, I should say. Now the processor. It's going to be running on Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, which is, you know, a pretty um, up and coming chip right now. It's being used on a lot of Android devices, including the Samsung S22 Ultra and the S22 that just released. It's running on that chip currently. Powerful chip, so surely the performance of this Magic 4 Pro is going to be pretty impressive. RAM. Now, this phone. Now man, RAM is another section of a smartphone spec. When you're discussing smartphone specs, people always like to focus on the RAM because either a phone could have too much of it or maybe too little of it. So th this phone has eight to 12 gigs of RAM in between, you know, I think, because we also have a base model and we have the pro model, the lower end model. It could go up to 12 gigs. Now, again, going back to the charging speeds, why would you need or want that much RAM? You know, 12 gig gigabytes of RAM is something that would be needed for a PC, not much of a smartphone. I don't think you need that much RAM. I mean, is it, again, it goes, it goes back to this back and forth argument. Is it nice to have? That much RAM on the smartphone, yes, because that would mean you can you can you can run multiple applications, open multiple applications without losing progress or without losing anything that um that you were on. Nothing refreshes, and it's nice, but it's not needed. I feel like a flagship nowadays, eight is like the cap that you can go for RAM, because yes, your smartphone is a computer in a smaller form factor, but you're not running a rig, an actual PC on your pocket all the time. So having that much RAM for the, you know, for the average consumer, I don't, well, for the average consumer, they, they probably won't even care what RAM is or what RAM does, right? But you don't need that much RAM. Again, it's impressive. It's nice, but in some cases not needed. But inbuilt storage. Now this is the actual um, device's storage. You go from 128 to 512. Surprisingly, not one terabyte. This phone will not have a one, will not have one terabyte storage options available. Which uh, again, going back to this, is this really necessary type of argument? A lot of people are on the fence about having one terabyte options on the smartphone. It's not necessary. Now I feel like. I'm starting to notice a lot, a lot of the patterns here with the smartphone as we're discussing in this in this episode. A lot of this that's on this phone, charging speeds, RAM size, all the above. It's nice to have, but not necessary because you don't have to kit out a phone that much. Because like I said, you're running a small form factor with you at all times. You're not running a PC. 
So for you to have that much space, that much RAM, that much charging speeds on a small form factor like a smartphone, it really, you know, it really just adds, first of all, you're, you're paying up. Okay, the price, right? These phones are already expensive as it is. You're already paying like over 700, 800 to $1,000. You're, you're paying extra. Like if, if you were to kit out this phone with 12 gigs, the max storage, you're paying extra, right? So that's one thing. More, more, more money is coming out of, out of your wallet when you're paying for these phones. But also you don't need it. Now, unless you, again, unless you do videography and you edit videos, edit photos, most people edit photos and videos on a PC or on a laptop. Unless you're on a rush and you need to continue on with the workflow and continue on with your projects, people will open up Adobe Premiere Pro perhaps and do a couple of edits on their phone and then not touch it until they get back home and get on their computers. People don't do intensive work on smartphones as much as these companies think they do in my opinion. That's how I see it. I feel like these companies assume that a lot of people do a lot of intensive work on a smartphone compared to like another bigger form factor like a tablet or like a computer that they're like okay we need to add these options in because people will probably need it not like the majority of the audience is not going to need that much specs when it comes to their smartphone again if you're buying a pc if you're specking out a pc a tablet a laptop yes buy all the ram buy all the storage get the get the, the quickest charges that you can get with the quickest charging speeds get all that you need to get because this is your main working form factor a smartphone is used for work responding to text responding to emails but mainly it's used to catch up to entertain um, and just you know communicate a smartphone is used the main reason for a telephone phone in general is to communicate not a lot of people are going to be doing a lot of work on a smartphone right but that you know again that doesn't include everybody people actually like to edit on their phones because it's quick and efficient and convenient so this only that only goes to like the small percentage of people that actually do intensive work on their smartphones as well if you, if you want to go ahead but usually i feel like that these uh, additions are appreciated and they're welcome because more RAM, more storage means a better performing phone and a phone that can hold a lot more. But for the average consumer, it's not needed, you know? But that being said, I'm kind of surprised that they didn't, they didn't go with the one terabyte. But again, with these options, you're paying a lot more for the phone as a whole. So in a way you're saving more money, which is good. Now, water and dust resistance, it has a rate of IP68, pretty common for a lot of smartphones. And the software of this device, it's, it runs Magic's UI 6.0, which is based on Android 12. Now, that is the basic spec sheet of this phone. And again, impressive stuff. But if you're a tech geek, you'll be pretty familiar with most of these specs in general. So that's the Magic 4 Pro. The main highlight of this phone is definitely the charging speed, which is what I wanted to really emphasize in this section of the podcast. 100 watts. Again, this is, you know, the big model throughout this week's episode. It's fantastic. It's great. But is it really necessary? Question mark. I'll let you guys be the judge of that if you run into this episode. Again, everyone's going to have different arguments. Everyone's going to have different opinions, but that's the joy of this. Now, all right, so that section was supposed to be the last section of today's episode, but we just segued and transitioned into it, which is fine. The last section for for today's episode is going to be, or this week's episode is going to be, I'm going to be discussing and going over certain mitigations that were um, put in place for Call of Duty's Warzone, anti-cheat system known as ricochet now for any of you guys who are gamers um any of you guys who game 
when they're on console or PC, online gaming. You guys pretty sure are familiar and understand the frustration of what cheating brings to the typical player base. Cheating is not fun, you know. Cheating, in my opinion, ruins the overall experience of what an online game should be and it's just not fun overall for the typical player base or the casual player base who just wants to hop on play a few games with their boys with their crew you know just rank up unlock what they want to unlock and just have fun now this is this has become an uproar in the in the online gaming scene recently especially with games like call of duty warzone apex legends and games like fortnite battle royale for example um it, it's become too really bad to the point where creators and um streamers leave these particular games that have the abundance of cheaters and hackers to, to go play other games and it's like at that point as a game development company you know that something is going wrong here and you're losing your player base so what do you have to do step your security game up and create what is known as an anti-cheat which an anti-cheat for those of you who don't know is a system that prevents hackers from doing what they do whether it's through banning or adding particular systems or um what do you call it integrations that give an edge on the typical audience so that they can actually combat and play against these particular hackers if they run into them it's a system that prevents hacking overall so for years people have been asking for years let me okay let me just say something else before i go on to that call of duty the history of call of duty it's been, it's a mixture of a lot of highs and a lot of lows over the years. People have been asking for um, the removal of skill-based matchmaking. Console players have been on the edge and just, you know, speaking up for the addition of FOV slider on a console, unbalanced weapons, the abundance of cheaters, recycled content, all that all that jazz right again these those are just a few of the examples of the lows that the game has been going through throughout the years and you know out of all those things that i mentioned the anti-cheat was one of the major ones that people were really loud about people were really talking about this anti-cheat and like we need it and we need it now and we've been asking this, for this anti-cheat for years especially when warzone first came out because warzone is now this big battle royale addition to the game we're gonna have multiple tournaments multiple competitive uh competitions and cheating cannot be at the forefront with this game mode so we need an anti-cheat activision finally came into the conclusion they came into terms with the release of caldero and vanguard that we're gonna be launching out ricochet for the very first time Call of Duty fans are excited, Call of Duty fans are happy, the community sees this as a major win, but that doesn't mean that cheating will just disappear overnight. There's still cheaters on Caldera and the Warzone as a whole. So recently, Activision has implemented these mitigations or techniques to help the typical casual player combat these hackers and have a chance whenever they run into these hackers. Two of them that were found were damage shield and invincibility. And by the way, all this information that I'm about to speak on and mention was from articles from The Verge and video references from content creator Prestigious Key. So damage shield and invincibility. So pretty much what the damage shield is is where bullets completely bounce off and damage that you take from these hackers are reduced. This has been shown through a lot of videos and streamers, streamers like Tim the Tatman, for example. He, he was streaming one time, I was actually watching the stream and saw this happen live. He he was trying to fly, he was flying out from a helicopter and he was getting shot out from a cheater. And if you notice, his health 
both armor and regular player health was dropping pretty pretty slow it wasn't dropping at the normal rate that usually when you when you do get shot at in call of duty warzone it drops pretty quick it was dropping pretty slow so a lot of people started to wonder why is this help dropping that slow that was the mitigation coming to play and just a little detail about these mitigations right they don't happen they don't tend to happen after a game is finished with machine early machine learning and smart ai these mitigations happen on the fly in real time when you're playing the game so as soon as this anti-cheat detects cheaters or knows that the cheaters in the game then these these mitigations or techniques activate on the fly as you're playing when you're getting shot at so then a difference is being made at that very moment and not after or before a game is going to begin which is pretty it's it's great i mean it's fantastic stuff because this gives a more of an edge on the players who are, who are being affected by the cheating as a whole so yes machine learning and intelligent ai these mitigations happen in real time as you as you're playing a game of warzone live which again is pretty impressive but yeah, so, so yeah, that's the broad aspect of what the damage shield is. So if you do play Warzone and you notice that your health is not dropping at a normal rate, you know that there's probably a hacker in your lobby or the person that was shooting at you is a hacker. So for those of you who play Warzone, now you know. And um, like I said, these mitigations happen in real time. And that's just not the only one. Invincibility is, an, is the second mitigation that was found from the Ricochet system. Now, invincibility is basically, I mean, it's pretty much straightforward, self-explanatory. You turn invisible from the hacker's POV. You're not actually invisible. So if you as the player gets, gets shot at from a hacker, you don't turn invisible like your operator is still there in the flesh you can still see your operator it's still visible but from the hacker's pov your, your character completely vanishes which obviously is going um it's a dis disadvantage to the hacker because they can't see you and if they can't see you obviously they can't kill you so pretty funny one in fact because i can imagine you know being a hacker and just suddenly seeing the player disappear like, like where the hell did they even go that that's one of the um warzone anti-cheat mitigations coming into play from ricochet so crazy stuff i mean the actions that activision is taking to combat these hackers is great i mean it's a long time coming like i said you know one of the major lows that call of duty has had over the years is really taking the time to listen to their fans and just do what the fans want but you know with these mitigations with ricochet actually you know coming into play and existing in the world of call of duty with a lot of cheaters the fact that we have an anti-cheat system is great for the card community now me personally i stopped playing card after uh, modern warfare after the lifespan of modern warfare ended i i don't know i just i felt like personally a cold war didn't seem like a long-term game for me to be to enjoy on the long run and vanguard i just didn't want to buy vanguard for my own personal preferences my own personal reasons so i stopped playing cod for a good while but for the people who are still in this community and in the space and still love this game i'm happy for you man i'm happy that hackers are finally getting put to an end they're finally being stopped because like i said cheating when it comes to gaming cheating overall is the the storm cloud above our heads you know it's it's a thorn by our side because we don't want to queue up in a normal match or even a tournament match a very competitive match and constantly have the thought in our minds that there's going to be cheaters ruining the experience for every single player um in that current match or in that match that's happening especially dude i can imagine being a competitive player right playing for like over fifty thousand dollars and you're, you're doing really good your team is like dropping 
eight kills each, right? 20 kill game in total. Doing really good. Last couple of teams, you're about to win the tourney. And one out of those few players that are left is a hacker. Whether it's through wall hacks, magnetic bullets, um, any, any hacks that are available to use, it's not a fun time. You know, at that point, you already lost a chance to win over $50,000 and you lost the tournament because of, of a particular hacker. And as a player, I mean, you can only do so much to speak your word, speak up and get the player banned, but the hacker is going to find other ways to come back. It's going to find other ways to find different cheats and just retaliate and fire back. And that's what a lot of people are saying, that with these mitigations, the company themselves, Activision, has admitted that this is going to be a tug of war between hackers. That referring to the sense of every mitigation, every technique that we have, every action that we take to combat a hacker, they're always going to find ways to counterattack that, and it's just going to be a back and forth battle. So every step that take that, that these hackers take, this company has to take two steps up higher. They have to take two steps more. Than these hackers so it's a back and forth battle so even if you ban these players even if you um implement these mitigations they're always going to find different ways to come at and start hacking and that's you know that's the part about it that it's never going to end you know doesn't matter if you've been banning accounts because that's what the company has been doing recently with ricochet and this uh, anti-cheat was banning over like 50,000 um, Activision accounts or Warzone accounts, which banning, okay, is great because they're not, they're not even allowed to play the game as a whole. They can't even access the game. And, you know, it's what they deserve if you're hacking. But at the same time, you can't tell me they can't just make another account or find another way to get back into the game. I guess they say, oh, when we ban accounts, we ban all secondary accounts and everything. They still come back, man. Hackers are still existing no matter what. So it is a back and forth battle, but the fact that Activision is finally taking actions and doing what they need to do to stop this abundance of hacking and Call of Duty Warzone is fantastic. And it's just not war. It's, it's not only Warzone. You know, you got games like PUBG, Apex Legends, and Fortnite who've had dealt with hackers in the past and they've done their own methods of, um, you know, dealing with these particular players who use these hacks and ruin the experience for everyone else. I actually, I've seen Apex videos in the past of like, um, Tim the Tatman when he plays with a lot of um, pro Apex players and a common cheat that I've found while watching these videos is magnetic bullets. No, magnetic bullets, what they are, is bullets that if you miss them no matter where you're shooting at or what direction you're shooting at while in the gunfight they automatically attach to the head of the player's operator or legend which means automatic headshots every time you miss a bullet now obviously when you're trying to evade or find cover or fight this particular hacker with this cheat you're not gonna win because every shot that they miss is a headshot for them so, you know, that cheat is a pretty interesting one. You also, go, you also go, go have other cheats like um, more speed or just you become more agile. And wall hacks, which is another pretty common one, which wall hacks, you can see through walls, you can see players from afar. Instant aimbot, when an aimbot automatically locks onto a player, not aim assist. Aimbot is different from aim assist. Aimbot literally clicks and locks on to any player they can aim at. While aim assist is just a minor assist that the game provides you when you're aiming. So, yeah, I mean, cheating isn't fun, man. And if you are a hacker or you've hacked in the past, we don't claim you. <laughs> I'm going to say that right now. We do not claim you. But, hey, I'm just playing. No, but I mean, th these mitigations are fantastic and I applaud Activision for finally taking action against these this group of people. And I mean, let's see where it goes from here. If you guys ha uh, are not aware that this year's COD is set to be a sequel 
to the 2019 Call of Duty Modern Warfare. And we're, we're going to get a new version of Warzone with a new engine, new guns. And it's going to be interesting to see how this anti-cheat system with these mitigations is going to evolve, evolve with COD games in the future and COD titles coming out in the future. So, yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, that's it for Warzone and the mitigations. If you play Warzone and you run and you notice that your health doesn't drop, like I've said previously, or anything of that sort, if you guys discover any mitigations, if you want to leave them in the comments or tweet them to me or DM them to me, like, hey, I just discovered this particular technique. Mind if you talk about it? Feel free. Um, leave comments. Um, message me on my socials and let me know if there are any new mitigations that people discovered because these techniques tend, tend to be like on the low you know they're, they're not very um you know what's the word um activision doesn't really openly say that, that these techniques are being used in the game they, they just they're, they're just there they just happen on the fly like i said these techniques are activated in real time so people discover them as they go so if you play warzone and you discover any any of these mitigations dm them to me or just post them tweet them to me i'll make sure i'll, I'll leave my socials on underneath uh these podcast episodes so you guys can quickly access it and just send me whatever you want to send so with that being said that's warzone that's anti-cheat that's the state of warzone right now if you guys want me to continue talking about Warzone, let me know. And we have topped out at 37 minutes, and that'll be it for this episode. Oh, before I go, of course, we always end these episodes off with the disability fact of the episode. And with that, I'll leave you guys for next week. So, the disability fact of the episode is autism is more common than childhood cancer, diabetes, and AIDS combined. So with that being said, thank you for everyone who's listening and I'll catch you guys next week for episode 12. We're already at double digits and um, I couldn't be any happier. You know, like I said, for anyone that comes across these episodes, I appreciate and thank for your support overall. It really, really means a lot to me. And, you know, even if, um, you know, even if people like my content or they don't, I, kn I know that with any point of these episodes, Anything that you guys can relate to or learn from, even if it's just one little thing, that makes me happy overall. Doing these episodes and learning about these things and talking about things that I'm really passionate about is fun to me. So any support that comes along that way is well enough appreciated. I'm sorry to go on, on a little tangent. It's just once in a while, I like to let it be known that the help and support, I see it and, and I see it all and I appreciate it all. Anyways, Thank you for listening. This was episode 11 of the show. See you guys next week for episode 12. You guys take care of it all.